Suki. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Yuritsa. I am the rehabilitation manager at Pelican Harbor Seabird Station. And I'm gonna talk today about some basics in Pelican rehabilitation. Um, I've been at Pelican Harbor for about nine years and Pelican Harbor Seabird Station has been in operation for about 40 years. In the very beginning, we started with just Pelicans then it kind of grew to pelicans and other seabirds. And then it grew to the facility we are today where we take in a variety of species of birds, small mammals and reptiles. Um, the pelicans are still kind of our specialty. Um, so I'm gonna talk uh, mostly about brown pelicans. That's the most common species we see here in Florida and that come through our doors. Uh, we also occasionally get in American white pelicans, um, but very rarely. Um, so a lot of my pictures will be brown pelicans, but a lot of this info can transfer over to other species of pelicans. Um, so just some background basic info, if you've never rehab pelicans or had pelicans in care before, um, they are mouth breathers. So they don't have um, nostrils to breathe out of. They have um, these very small uh, nair slits, and that's used for salt drainage. They don't breathe out of them. So when you are holding a pelican, you have to make sure their beak is cracked so they can breathe. Um, they have a lot of air sacs um, to help them with buoyancy and get off the ground. They are big birds, um, but they generally average about six pounds in weight, so they're not very heavy. They have the guler pouch, of course, which helps them um, when hunting and fishing. Um, and then this picture around here, I wanted to show the inside of the mouth. You can see the glottis um, right down the middle there. And on each side um, of the glottis, this kind of V, there's this little um, cartilage-like um, thing um, that helps kind of protect the glottis um, and helps with the pouch um, as it's stretching um, when it's holding water and things like that. And then they have uh, totopalmate feet. So all four of their toes are webbed. Um, so they are good swimmers. Uh, as opposed to most gulls and ducks where only three of their toes um, are webbed. So they're strong flyers, swimmers, um, and mouth breathers. Um, and then for aging a pelican, um, usually hatchlings are gonna be these little gray blobs, this top picture here, you can kind of see where the eggs are, this little baby pelican head, um, he looks like he's yawning. Um, and then as they get older, they're kind of bigger gray blobs. Um, so this picture on the right here, and you can definitely see that dino DNA in a nestling pelican. Um, they're very prehistoric and he has the little pouch and everything there. Um, when they are getting to a couple weeks of age, they start to get the downy feathers, so the white fluff here, like in this guy here. Um, 10 weeks of age or so, they'll still have a lot of fluffy feathers, but they'll get some of their juvenile feathers coming in. Um, so this lower picture on the right um, is some older nestlings. They're still pretty white and fluffy, but there is some juvenile um, older feathers on the wings and the head coming in. Pelicans reach full size in about three to four months, but they're still getting fed by the parents. They still have their baby feathers and they're still needing um, protection and care. And then one to three years of age, they'll have their juvenile uh, immature feathers. So they'll be brown on the body with a white belly for a while. 
and then about four years plus, um, they have their adult feathers in. Um, and then um, for sexing, uh, it can be kind of tricky. Usually males are bigger than females with longer bills, um, but sometimes you'll get a small male and a large female. So usually if you really 100% want to know, you have to send out uh, for a blood test. And then when you're trying to capture an injured pelican, uh, usually what we do is we try to lure them with fish to get them as close to us as possible. Um, it actually works pretty well, uh, especially for the juvenile birds. The adult birds can sometimes be smarter. Um, it doesn't work as well. But if you can get them close enough, sometimes you can just straight up grab the bill and then kind of scoop up their body. Um, or if you have two people, someone can come up behind you with a net um, and net them real quick. Um, so this top right picture, uh, my staff member, we got a call for injured pelican on a fishing pier and she's sitting there trying to lure, lure a specific pelican towards her so she can grab it. Um, and you can see uh, most of these pelicans are juvenile. They're brown with a lot of white bellies. So they tend to be a little easier to trick. Um, and then this image here um, is kind of the hold that you'll do for a pelican. So you'll football hold their body. They'll have their wings tucked in under your armpit. Um, usually your hands under the belly there. The feet can usually um, just kind of hang down. Um, if you try to hold the feet, sometimes that kind of gives them leverage to push off of you. Um, so we usually just leave the feet hanging there. Um, and then um, my staff member here is holding the bill cracked open with her finger in between. Um, a lot of people do this as like a sure way to make sure the bill is open. Um, you don't have to do it. I usually don't do it myself because this bill is pretty sharp. And if they are struggling a lot, they can give you like these paper cut like scratches on your fingers, um, even through the gloves. Um, but if that's comfortable for you, you can do that. Um, and then just uh, quickly our intake protocol for when we get in pelicans at our facility. Um, obviously we'll do a thorough exam. We'll see what's going on with them. If there's injuries, external hooks, um, sub Q emphysema, anything like that. Um, this picture here, I'm looking inside the pouch of this juvenile pelican um, to look for any fungal lesions, or maybe there was a hook in there that I'm trying to see is visible um, to see if I can get it out. Uh, we usually will do a PCV test um, at least to just kind of get a general idea for any possible anemia or dehydration, especially for the um, weak and underweight um, birds, they tend to be um, a little anemic. We'll get a temperature and x-ray plop. So we won't put the pelican under anesthesia for an x-ray um, because we usually just wanna see if they have internal hooks. So we'll bundle them up in a towel and plop them on our x-ray table and take a quick image. Um, so we can see if they have internal hooks in the GI tract and if they do, then we can proceed. But if for whatever reason, they might have an internal hook that we're trying to see a specific placement, then we will put them under, under anesthesia to get a more um, straight alignment image. Um, and then we usually give a dewormer. Uh, Ivermectin is kind of our go-to, but we will use Panicure or Strongit sometimes. Pelicans tend to have roundworms. That's the most common intestinal parasite they'll have. Um, and they're usually fine living with it, but usually the sickly underweight birds will get overrun with the parasite and it could make them even more um, sickly. So we'll give that. And then we'll give some um, subcutaneous fluids with the vitamin B on intake. Um, and then depending on dehydration, we may continue that for a day or two um, and we'll give vitamin E on intake. Um, so this is a image of a orphan baby pelican that we got in on the scale here. This is an, an older nestling, still very fluffy body um, with some gray brown coming in on the head. And this bottom picture down here um, is a pelican that got very lucky and somehow that hook did not puncture the eye at all. It just kind of got the skin around the eye. So that pelican did okay, luckily. 
Um, and so for the common reasons for admission, um, fishing hook and line related injuries. So um, sometimes hooks get caught in the pouch and then they get ripped out for whatever reason and they'll get pouch tears. Um, like I said before, swallowed hooks, like in this x-ray image here, this pelican um, swallowed several hooks and he actually has a hook in the wing here. Um, and then this bottle image is a pelican with some pouch tears there. It's pretty common to see. Um, trauma um, related injuries. So sometimes they are hit by cars if they're flying across a causeway and just was too low. Um, we've gotten calls for pelicans hit by boats accidentally um, or just unknown trauma, botulism weakness, underweight, and orphans. And I'll dive into each one on the next slides. And this top image here is us putting a pelican um, under anesthesia with a mask. So for us, because they don't make masks for pelican, we had to um, come up with something. So we got two um, soda bottles at that time. Now we have two juice bottles that we drunk we cut them, we tape them together, and then um, kind of create a little spout for our anesthesia tubing there. Um, and then we just have this long mask that we can use for pelicans to mask them down. So going into fishing hook and line um, entanglement injuries. So depending on how bad the injury you may do a number of things, um, if there's a pretty, deep wound because of a hook that got ripped out. Um, you may need to flush it, debride it if it's infected, um, cleanse it with Dermaclor, put some sort of ointment like silver cream or honey. Um, a lot of times we'll get in calls for finders, mostly fishermen that say they have an injured pelican that had a hook and they went ahead and removed the hook. Um, and so usually they rip it out and that causes more damage. Um, um, here at the facility, we will cut the tips of the hook and get the barb, and then we'll remove the hook so it causes less damage. Um, and then with line, you might have constriction injuries, so they'll get line entanglement around the wings or around the legs, and it cuts, cuts off circulation. So we will add a vasodilator like a Soxaprene um, along with pain meds, laser therapy, to make sure that that limb is getting a blood flow. We may add antibiotics or pain meds like enrofloxin, um, SMZ, Exceed, Tramadol, Meloxicam. Meloxicam, um, you do wanna be careful when you use because uh, pelicans do have a sensitivity to it. So we use a lower than normal dose and sometimes we may even just give it once a day instead of twice a day for them. Um, and then um, for radiographs, like I said, we'll do an x-ray pop initially, but if we feel we need more specific um, radiographs, then we'll put them under anesthesia for that. Um, and for internal hooks, we do a cotton fish method. So we'll wet a wad of cotton and um, feed it to the pelican if it is stable and able to eat. Um, we'll put it in a fish and feed it to the pelican and the cotton is not digestible. So usually within a few hours or overnight, the pelican will throw up the cotton and the hook and line will get entangled with it and it'll come up with the cotton. So we always try that method first. If they do have internal hooks, it works really well, um, maybe like 75% of the time. Um, if that doesn't work, then we can put a pelican under anesthesia and go in manually to try to remove the hook from the stomach or GI tract. Um, and then if that doesn't work, sometimes the hook is embedded in the stomach lining. Um, our vets can do surgery to remove hooks. And then over the past three years or so, we started using laser therapy in our treatments for various things. So it can inhibit pain and inflammation, promote cell growth, and even um, can be used to kill bacteria and funguses and things like that. So this is an image of an intern um, cleaning up a wound on a pelican that we, I think we're going to suture close here. And then this image on the right is a pelican that got um, a first round of pouch repair surgery. And so after we finished, we did some laser therapy with our handheld laser um, and then started him on medications. 
And then for trauma, um, like I said, usually it's hit by something. Sometimes it's unknown. Uh, maybe it was fishing hook and line related. We're not sure. Um, we may um, do wound management. We'll put on medications. We can do laser therapy for um, trauma wounds also. Um, for things like fractures, so the images of these x-ray here, this pelican, um, this is actually a recent patient came in with a fractured humerus and our vet was able to pin it uh, with a pin and an external um, fixer there. So we're hoping that that heals okay. Um, and then the, these three top images here were a pelican that came in um, with a pretty bad wound to his patagium. Um, it actually looked worse than this on intake. This was after a couple of days of treatment um, using something called Duoderm, which was really amazing. Um, and then it started to kind of scab over and heal. We were doing laser therapy, uh, physical therapy to make sure that the, um, excuse me, that patagium wasn't getting too tight um, as it was healing. Um, and then the third image here um, is it all healed. The feathers grew back. Um, and that pelican was released, which was really exciting. Um, and then this image here, this pelican came in with a bum foot. So he has a shoe on to try to um, get it, get him using it naturally. Um, but these kinds of things just take time to heal. And pelicans are really good at healing. Um, generally, they bounce back from a lot of things and can heal really well um, from different things. Um, the next thing is botulism poisoning. So botulism is a naturally occurring bacteria in large bodies of water. Um, it can like, I guess, bloom um, with like pollution or high heat and it can affect fish. And when these pelicans eat the fish, it affects the pelican. And it's pretty much a slow paralyzing of their body. Usually the first thing that goes is their ability to blink, they get really weak, then they're unable to stand. Um, and as it's paralyzing, then they're unable to hold their head up and they can die from it if not treated. Um, we see that it does hit pelicans pretty hard, more so than other gulls and things like that. It does take them a while to bounce back compared to other birds. But we usually will give a round of toxaban or activated charcoal um, fluid therapy, so flushing their system out, um, sub-Q orally, um, IV if necessary. And because they can't blink, their eyes will start to dry out. And then if they're flailing about, they're scratching their eyes on their wings or on the ground. And so they sometimes get corneal ulcers. So we um, always keep their eyes lubed. We may start eye medication if they do have ulcers or to prevent ulcers while they're in care. And then as soon as we can, um, we'll do physical therapy and hydrotherapy to get them stronger and get them using their muscles normally. Um, we see that getting them in a, a swim tub or out in the pool um, as soon as they're getting strong enough helps them a lot um, from that point on, kind of bounce back faster, uh, especially if there are other pelicans around. Um, they're out in the sun and the water swimming and they tend to do really well. And then for us here, um, our rule is if they are at the point where they are unable to lift their head, we usually will consider euthanasia because um, they tend to just not be able to bounce back really well um, from that point. Um, but this is a juvenile pelican down here, uh, maybe a, a second year um, that uh, we got a call for that was just really weak, unresponsive with possible botulism. Um, and the same thing for this adult pelican up here, this image. And then weakness and underweight. Um, we usually see this with the younger birds, first year, second year. Uh, we call them young and dumb. Um, so they're out in the world, um, just kind of having a hard time figuring things out, I guess and maybe they're not able to find food for a while. Um, and so they'll start to get sick and, and weak. And usually they'll come in with these little fungal lesions in their pouch, uh, which we'll treat with nystatin topically. Um, we'll do physical therapy, oh, I'm sorry, um, fluid therapy, uh, sub-Q and orally. Um, 
we'll do a PCV to see where they're at in terms of um, anemia or dehydration. And we'll give a dewormer, but we'll also do a fecal test to see if there is anything um, other than roundworms they might be um, dealing with. And then while they're in care, they're getting a liquid diet usually at first, and then they're moving on to um, soft fish diet like Capelin. Um, they're getting vitamin supplements um, and just supportive care all around until they're starting to get stronger um, and then eventually eating on their own. And then orphan pelicans. So we actually haven't had too many orphans these past couple of years. Um, but usually every year we'll get calls from other facilities that got in um, orphans, uh, mostly because a storm um, maybe came through and, and messed up a, a rookery somewhere. Um, but depending on the age they come in, we may uh, use a puppet or just kind of hide our face as best we can when we're offering food and things like that. <clears throat> They're getting vitamin supplements. And as soon as we can, we'll put them with conspecifics. So we're lucky enough to have a group of permanent pelicans that are non-releasable, that a couple of them are really good fosters for babies. So one in particular is our education pelican, Pepe. Um, so he's up um, in the top left, in the top right here with an orphan. This was a few years ago. Um, so he does really well with the babies. He feeds them, he'll protect them, um, and they do great. So that's easy for us because then this pelican kind of grows up with other pelicans. We'll keep an eye on him, obviously, weekly weight checks, make sure everything's okay. Um, but then after a certain point, um, we'll do live fish school. So once they're kind of fluttering around more, swimming more, uh, most of their um, baby fluff has um, disappeared. We'll put live fish in a pool and see if they have the instinct to go for them, try to hunt them. Um, they may not necessarily be successful, but as long as they're trying, then that's a good indicator that they'll be good to go. Um, and then also, luckily, uh, nestling pelicans are nest floor feeders for the first uh, couple weeks. So the parents will just regurgitate food in the nest and the baby will pick from the bottom of it. So when we get in really small nestlings, we can just offer a dish of cut up soft um, kind of mushy fish um, in their uh, cage and they can just kind of eat on their own. So we don't have to necessarily hand feed them. Um, and so this is just kind of a list of the common medications that we use. Um, obviously there's a lot that you know we use that might not be on here, but not as often. Um, so antibiotics, dewormers, um, Emeraid Pisifor and the Missouri Fish Analog are the liquid diets that we mostly use for the uh, underweight, emaciated guys um, when we're giving them a liquid diet. And then um, for inside caging, you don't necessarily need anything too special for pelicans. Um, we just have shoreline cages um, or like wall cages like you'd see at a vet office. So we'll put line the bottom of that with newspaper. We'll use these rubber mats. Um, so the poop kind of goes through that into the newspaper and they're not stepping on it too much. Um, and then we'll put a towel to cover the door. This baby pelican has a, a UV lamp. Um, and that's pretty much the gist of it. Sometimes um, we might put like a really big log in there um, to kind of give them some comfort, kind of be up a little bit, um, but they don't generally need perching if they're inside um, short term usually. Um, but um, during the high season when we are full, sometimes we may need to bring in like extra large dog crates and we may use the newspaper and rubber mat for that or just put um, thick towel on the bottom of that um, and that works too. And then for our outside enclosures, um, we have several pens that we use for pelicans. Our permanent pelican has the biggest pen um, since they're here permanently. Um, but we do have uh, quite a few mangrove trees um, in the corners of the pens. The pelicans like to perch on them. Um, we have high perching for them. 
um, so they can fly around and perch on top. Um, we'll have lower kind of um, wood pilings like these, the pelicans like. Uh, a couple of the pens have these just kind of piles of large rocks um, that they like to um, stand on to. Our pens have sand for substrate, which um, we don't have any issues with. Uh, we do every so often uh, make sure that we flip it um, so it doesn't get packed down or volunteers rake it every day because um, it can start to just get packed down and like start to end up kind of hard like cement. So you do wanna make sure that you move it around and flip it and, and change it up. Um, and then our pools actually have a um, pipe system that connects with the bay that we're located at. So we can drain the pools um, every morning and then they get filled up with bay water. So the pelicans have bay water to swim in. Uh, a couple of the pens have uh, roofs over the pools just for some sunshade and they like to perch on top of those. And usually the pools have at least one really big um, like a tree branch across it. So the pelicans um, like to perch on top of that too. And then um, our permanent pelicans get um, these black bins of fresh water that they'll play in. Um, the re rehab guys usually just have the pool. And then the uh, pen itself is made with uh, vinyl coated fencing and we just have these black slats that we put through them to give a privacy barrier um, and they tend to do pretty good in that. Um, we don't really have much issues with pelicans messing up their feathers um, in our pens and they do pretty good. Um, so when you've gone through the whole process, um, how do you know for sure that Pelican is release ready? Um, so obviously they have to be able to fly. Um, their weight has to be good. So an average weight's about three kilograms, um, which is about six pounds, I believe. Um, so that's kind of the average. Sometimes you'll get in a small Pelican that may be, you know, around the two kilogram mark, but you don't want any Pelican to be released less than that because um, that's um, underweight. Um, and then I've seen pelicans that come in at around four kilograms, some big, some big guys. Their body condition um, is good, um, so they're not thin or dehydrated still. Their original issue has resolved, whether it be a fracture or a wound, um, everything's healed. Their waterproofing is 100%. Um, they are in the water often. So you want to make sure that they have that waterproofing protection. Um, sometimes we'll see pelicans in the bay that should be floating on top of the water, but they're kind of sinking in the water. So that's not normal. So something is wrong with their buoyancy and their waterproofing maybe. Um, their behavior is normal. So they have a natural fear of people for the most part. Um, for us here, it's kind of hard because pelicans have gotten so used to hanging around marinas and fishing piers where people feed them scraps. They tend to be a little more, I guess, habituated around people than normal. But um, in general, you want them to have a fear of people or to run away from you or try to get away if you try to approach them. They have to have 100% sight. So they can't have any eye injuries. Um, or any issues, both um, eyes have to have 100% vision. Um, and if not, unfortunately, um, that pelican would have to be euthanized because of the way they hunt for food. Um, they need to be able to see 100%. Um, and then, like I said, for orphans, we do the live fish uh, school for them. Uh, their feet and webbing have to be good. So uh, sometimes they'll come in with injuries that resulted in them losing um, a bit of a toe or two, or some of their webbing is missing. And generally it's okay if they are able to um, walk and swim fine, um, then that's okay to release them that way. Um, and then for us, we actually have uh, USGS bands, um, so silver federal bands that we'll put on our pelicans before release. Um, we are working on getting sight bands um, for that so they can be kind of more easy to read 
out in the wild. So hopefully that'll happen soon. Um, and so this top picture here, um, you can see the pel couple pelicans at different stages of age. So this pelican in the front here is an adult in breeding plumage. He has a yellow head and a white neck. He has that gray silver body. Um, and then behind him, looks like a maybe third year pelican. He still has some brown feathering on him, a white head um, that looks like a white neck coming in. Um, and then the guy behind him is has even a more brown on him. So their um, age stages um, kind of mix and um, sometimes they'll come in with this pepper sprinkled on the head. So they're, it's pretty interesting. They'll come in kind of a variety of colors. Um, and then this picture down here, I just thought was cool. This was a pelican at a rookery feeding his baby. So you can kind of see the little wings there. Um, and then, um, so for some uncommon reasons for admission, uh, we'll see pelicans that have a fish stuck in their throat. So again, they're hanging around marinas and beaches where people are fishing, throwing them scraps. Uh, sometimes they'll throw them just like whole fish like this one. And this is not a normal fish that they would be hunting for in the wild. It has a lot of spikes on the top there. And so you got to call for this guy. He had a lump in his throat. It looks like he was struggling to regurgitate it. We were able to catch him. We put him under anesthesia and we had to get in there and kind of put her hand around the spiky part here and kind of pulled it down so we can kind of pull the, the fish out. So that was a, a pretty big fish, um, but that can um, also cut them, um, cause injury in their throat and their pouch when they are being fed the, this fish that they just normally wouldn't hunt on their own. Um, and then we'll occasionally get in pelicans um, that have been oiled. Um, again, they're hanging around marinas where there's a lot of boat traffic, um, a lot of oil in the water. They're swimming in the water, um, begging for fish, and the feather quality starts to go down. Their waterproofing starts to mess up. Um, and so we'll, we'll see that. Um, luckily, not so often. Um, since I've been here, we haven't had any sort of oil spill situation either, um, but I know in the past years, that also was something that um, we've had to deal with. And then one thing you probably wouldn't think of is frostbite pelicans. So uh, we'll get in uh, northern pelicans that migrate down to Florida that by the time they get here, they have frostbite on their feet, um, on their legs, on their webbing. Um, and sometimes it's not so severe. Sometimes it's pretty severe and they end up losing a toe or two or some of their webbing. Um, and again, if they're still able to swim and walk and they have the majority of their toes and webbing, it should be fine. Um, but um, one year, it's 2014, I think, we got in seven pelicans transferred from a Northern facility that um, couldn't winter them over. And they all had frostbite on their feet and their legs. Um, and uh, seven pelicans, I think six out of the seven made it. Um, the last pelican, his frostbite was too severe um, and he actually lost a foot. So that was our first kind of uh, time dealing with frostbite. And so every winter we occasionally will get a pelican or several that come down with frostbite on their feet, which is interesting. Um, and then, yeah, I think I may have gone a little too short, but are there any questions? <laughs> um, there is a question here from Bailey. I would love to ban our brown pelicans on release. What does the process for applying for those banding permits look like? Um, yes, so we actually um, used to have a banding permit um, years ago with um, our founder, Harry and Darlene, um, or Harry and Wendy back then. And back then they had the banding permit and a site band, which was black with white lettering. Um, unfortunately, they didn't have the best record keeping and they lost the permit. So um, a few years ago, we were applying for the permit again, and it was very hard because they know that 
We had a bad history of record keeping, but we um, found info for a lot of the bands that were missing and we were able to get them. Um, but you pretty much apply through um, US Fish and Wildlife. Um, and I can send links for that through the USGS. Uh, you pretty much tell them, um, you know, why you want bands, what species you want to band, and any other info. Um, and they kind of review that and let you know, I guess, if you're approved and, and whatnot. So right now we just have banding permit for pelicans. Um, hopefully down the road, we can um, get a permit to band um, maybe other seabirds, raptors, um, things like that. But it is kind of a hard uh, process to go through. And then another question, do you find that laser therapy helps with frostbite? Um, I would think so. Um, at the time we had our big frostbite um, pelicans, we didn't have our laser. And I feel like we haven't had a frostbite case um, in a couple of years, but um, yeah, the laser, we use it for almost everything um, from wounds to burns, um, fractures, um, infections, uh, fungus. So um, I would definitely try laser on the frostbite case um, and see if it helps because it promotes cell growth and healing. So it wouldn't hurt for sure. Um, okay. Don't know if there's any more questions. All right, you're welcome, Bailey. I'm sorry I went shorter um, than I thought I would. <laughs> um, thank you again for coming. Um, let's see. Don't know anything else I can go over. Um, pelicans in general are pretty hardy birds. Um, I feel they uh, can handle quite a bit. And like I said before, they heal really well from a variety of things. Um, I guess um, something that maybe they do or that we see that we struggle a lot is when they do end up having infections in joints and in the bone. Um, we see that they have a hard time bouncing back from those kinds of things. And we have, we try different treatments and things like that, um, but those can be kind of tricky to heal. Um, and then another question, do you give vitamin E capsules on admission? Uh, so we actually give a vitamin E injection um, um, on intake. Um, that's usually just kind of a one-time dose, um, unless our vet feels that there is some sort of um, deficiency, then maybe she might um, want us to continue it. But um, while they're in care, we actually do give um, auklet tabs or C tabs when we feed them. So that's just um, a vitamin supplement for them there. Um, thank you, Michelle. All right. Okay. Well, if nobody else has any questions, um, let's say so much for joining us. It's yep. one of the perks about having an online conference is that we're able to have people from all over. So this was fantastic. Um, thank you for, for joining us this weekend. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Enjoy the rest of the conference, everybody. Um, we'll see you in the next session soon.